Welcome to The Partial Perspective, a place where I share my perspective on everything in the space between life and death. I am your host, Pasho. Well, my Pachos Chachos, as every year is with my freshmen, we have begun Romeo and Juliet. And today we covered Acts 1 through 3. But for today's conversation, I'm going to simply start with something that inspired me while reading Act 1, Scene 2. Act 1, Scene 2 is where Paris is asking Juliet's father, Lord Capulet, for her hand in marriage. And he is very persistent. And Lord Capulet uh, tells him to either wait two years or to woo Juliet into falling in love with him, to which then Lord Capulet would give Paris his blessing. But that's not really what we're going to be even talking about. At the end of their conversation, Lord Capulet gives to a servant a list of the invitees to the party which Juliet and Romeo will eventually meet, kiss, and fall in love. Now, the servant uh, is left alone on stage, and he delivers a soliloquy where he is speaking out loud so that we, the audience, know what exactly he is thinking. And in this soliloquy, he admits to being ignorant and illiterate, and thus unable to complete his task of inviting the people whose names are on the sheet of paper that was given to him by Lord Capulet because he can't read the names that are on the sheet of paper given to him by Lord Capulet. And so he admits that he has to go find someone who does know how to read. And of course, as fate would have it, uh, he bumps into Romeo. But that's really as far as I'm going to get in the summary of Romeo and Juliet, because as we were reading this aloud, you know, I let my students choose roles and then we we don't perform it because they read it from their desk, but they read the roles and every once in a while I make them pause and interject with some ideas and opinions and examples of modern time. And we were discussing how William Shakespeare presents the servant as not intelligent, right? He misses, mixes things up like saying that fishermen need their pencils and painters need their nets. Obviously, uh, the reverse would be true, right? Painters would need pencils. Fishermen would need nets. And one of my students made a comment saying that, oh, the guy is stupid. To which I said, That's not necessarily true. He's not stupid. He's ignorant. And because he's a servant, he is ignorant on purpose, meaning that the upper crust of society purposefully made the lower classes illiterate and ignorant because stupid people are easy to control. They don't know what their rights are. They don't know how to argue or debate for more rights. They don't know how to read the Constitution or anything else like the laws that we have in our countries because, again, purposefully, they were not taught to be able to read and to write, which, you know, writing, as Jordan Peterson always says, is the process of thinking. It is virtually impossible to write anything down without thought. And that was the point. Empty their minds of thought, and they will never challenge you. And I gave some examples about the same idea was used with slaves, not just in our country, but throughout human history. By keeping slaves ignorant, slaves aren't aware of the unfair justice system. They simply accept the reality to which they are born. Until, like in our country, we had a very famous man, and since it is leap year, and since it is technically Black History Month, but that will be for another episode, probably in another year, I'm not a fan because it separates us, and I'm not a fan of things that separate us. I like to celebrate in unison. You know, it's kind of the whole idea of giving, you know, 
Black History Month is the same thing as having a black national anthem, which I think is atrocious. There's only one country. The country only needs one national anthem. And the purpose of that national anthem, as well as our beautiful old glory flag, the Stars and Stripes, is so that we are all unified under an ideology, under patriotism, that we all see each other as equals and not necessarily the same, but given the same inalienable rights that our wonderful creator has given to us. So as I was saying, an example of a slave who does learn to read and even goes as far as to Oxford in England to be educated is one of my favorite uh, people of color in history, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass came back literate, educated, with philosophy and ideas of law and virtue and justice, and he recognized that in the Declaration of Independence, it specifically says all men are created equal. It doesn't say only the white men are created equal. And so he began to inspire other people to recognize that truly the only way to fight an unjust system is to know the rules. And the only way to know the rules and to fight against them is to be able to read those rules. And then the next step will be able to challenge those rules by thinking and be able to share those thoughts through writing. And so I tried to explain to my students that we purposefully kept slaves ignorant so that they would not uprise, so they would not challenge. And thank goodness for people like Frederick Douglass. Then I moved on to the women's suffrage, because Susan B. Anthony is another wonderful example of women who, because of her father not being a douchebag and preventing his daughter from... uh, growing independent or being dependent upon a man and thus making her an independent woman, she read a little blurb in a magazine or newspaper rather that said, if you are an American citizen, come and vote. It is your responsibility as a citizen. And because she was able to read this, she went to the voting booth and the rest is in the books. She challenged the system and said, nowhere does it say that only men can. And she started to fight for the idea that women should be able to to vote too, but it was because she read the communication between men through newspapers and was able then to think and write and create pamphlets and distribute these ideas to other women and to eventually, you know, bring us to where all of our society now can be useful and not just half of them useful and the rest ignorant and dependent. I mean, why didn't we teach women how to read from the get-go? You know, we wanted to control them. We wanted them to be dependent upon us, us meaning men, because otherwise they would have their own thoughts and their own opinions and they wouldn't be so easy to manipulate and control as I guess men back in the day attempted to do. You know, it also reminded me, and and I shared this with my students too, of the women in Afghanistan prior to Joe Biden. It is my understanding that for the last 20 years, the United States only needed about two to 3,000 soldiers to control the entire country and prevent Al-Qaeda and all those other awful terrorist organizations to take over the country. And during those 20 years, there was a renaissance for women where they were able to learn to read, go to school, go to college and even rise so far as to become judges in their country. But of course, because blundering Biden uh, abandoned all of these people and abandoned this system, Al-Qaeda brought them back to the Dark Ages, where women now were only allowed to show their eyes, everything else had to be covered, they were property and no longer an independent individual. They wanted, again, to control these women by forcing them back into the house, and then preventing them from being educated, thus creating again the cycle of dependence that they would need on a man. And so I asked my students, how many Afghani women do you think are judges now that Joe Biden has abandoned them to Al-Qaeda? And very astutely, all of them recognized zero. And I followed up, well, how many women are going to school and learning to read and write in Afghanistan? And again, astutely, they all said zero. 
And I told them, why do you think that is? And of course, being my students, they said, because it's easier to control. Then they are forced dependence upon men to tell them what everything says, what the law is, what signs say what prices are, right? The more ignorant the person, the easier it is to trap them and to manipulate them into submission. And so I tried then to make the connection to our country and in our times where drugs, you know, recreational drugs like marijuana and the likes are really just bread and circus, right? There's nothing new under the sun. The Romans used to do this all the time with gladiator games and races and sports in order to pacify the people so that they weren't really thinking about the status of their society, the value and worth of their money. And so if you're just smoking pot on the couch, you are not challenging the authority figures that are in power. You're not recognizing how awful Joe Biden is as a dumb donkey president. And more so, we also promote in this material world the obsession with video games. Because if they're staring at a screen, shooting usually in violent games or distracting themselves rather than reading, evolving, growing, creating their own ideas, being able then to invent new things that would benefit our society, they are simply pacified and ignorant. The whole virtual reality idea of putting on a device that shuts out the real world to put them into a fake world, again, is the same thing. If you are living in misery, but you put these glasses on, and now instead of living in filth, you are living in a mansion that you can design all to your liking on a beachfront property, you are not questioning or challenging the status quo. And that is the point. They are purposefully ignorant because rich people have power, and people who have power want more power. And they don't want to share their slice of the pie with anybody. They are more than happy for my students to be stereotypical statistics. They are more than happy with them getting pregnant early and dropping out of school to take care of their child. They are more than happy with these kids pacifying themselves with marijuana and fentanyl and everything else. Because a lazy, ignorant person is no threat to the people in power. And so I tried to finish then the lesson by explaining to them, again, something that I tried to initiate from the very beginning. And I really wish all my colleagues and peers out there who refer to themselves as educators, as teachers, would teach this more than anything. They need to change the way they view education. It is not a burden. It is a gift. I tell them, you need to change the way you view reading because many of them hate to read. They would rather play video games. They would rather do drugs. They would rather involve themselves in sexual situations, not really emotionally understanding what all that entails, and then the consequences, which are awful and make them only more insecure When you give your body to someone who then no longer wants you because they're going on to the next person. Bag it, tag it, moving on to the next one type of idea. So they need to change the way they view reading if they want to change their lives for the better. And I really try to promote this idea that they must fall in love with reading. Because reading is the key to their success. Reading empowered Susan B. Anthony. Reading empowered Frederick Douglass. Reading empowered all those wonderful women and young girls in Afghanistan who were rising to the top and contributing to their society in a beneficial way. And not only must they change their mind about reading, but they have to change their attitude towards writing. Many of my students in a English class don't want to write. They would love it if all I would do is give them multiple choice questions that they could easily answer and be done. But I don't do that. I encourage them to fall in love with writing because, again, writing is thinking. 
And if they can't think, they can't debate, they can't formulate their own opinions. All they could do is regurgitate the same, the things that they have been told, that have been gaslit upon them. Whatever CNN morons or MSNBC useless humps of human flesh tell them to do, if they can't read and think, then all they are left is to echo the same stupid talking points of those dumb donkey TV heads on the television. I remind them, rich, successful people love to read and write. I believe it was something like rich, successful people read 30 books a year because it makes them grow. It exposes them to new ideas. It tells them what ideas are out there so that they can create new ones, right? I mean, when you get to doctorate degrees, Your dissertation, half of it at the beginning, is explaining what is already there and then being able to build off of the shoulders of giants and create your new ideas that will propel society forward. If the rich people do this, so too should you. And I try to end with my favorite passage from the Bible, as you know, Romans 12. Do not conform to the material world, but instead offer up yourself a living sacrifice through the renewal of your mind. Change your attitude towards education. Embrace education as the key to every door that will open and give you all the wonderful opportunities that probably not even you could have ever dreamt of. And watch how nothing but joy follows. Well, my Pachos Chachos, as always, I thank you for listening to me. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless you. And I'll talk to you next week. Goodbye.